Welcome to Bible 360 Ephesians. Ephesians is divided into two clear sections. The first half is filled with teachings, prayers, and exclamations about what it means to be in Christ. The second half is application and practical advice for how to live in this new way of Jesus. Paul came to Ephesus and was able to more fully explain the gospel for two plus years. The way of Jesus became influential enough that it affected the profits of the temple money-making machine. Temple business owners rioted against Paul, forcing him to leave the city, but the damage was already done. Ephesus was a missionary outpost despite being an epicenter for Greek and Roman religious practice. Paul doesn't point out any particular problems in Ephesus. It's a very encouraging book. The book starts poetically describing, in big picture strokes, God's eternal plan. God's plan had always been to unify all of humanity as part of God's family. Paul talks about purpose and destiny. Destiny is defined primarily by Christ. God had originally created humanity to be his people and was able to alter the disastrous trajectory humanity was stuck on by sending the Messiah. Paul declares that all he really wants for the Ephesians is for the Ephesians to grasp the glorious riches they have inherited through Christ Jesus and the power of God at work in them. Of course, this plan was dead in the water until Christ came because we were dead in our transgressions. Spiritual zombies, mindlessly following the passions of our own sinful flesh, we were complete slaves to disobedience and to demons. However, we have been rescued, not by anything we've done, but by God's grace. We're no longer zombies, but rather God's workmanship created to do good works. Speaking specifically to Gentile Christians, Paul reminds them how they had been quite outside God's plan in the Old Covenant. However, Jesus in his flesh had become our peace through the cross, breaking down the walls that had previously divided Jews and Gentiles. Uh, the Jews had likewise been alienated from God, although in a different manner, being condemned by the laws they were supposed to follow. But now both unfaithful Jews and outsider Gentiles were part of a new building built upon the foundations of the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles, with Jesus being the cornerstone, holding the whole thing together, the new temple of Yahweh. Instead of describing a step-by-step -step process of how this happened, which he does in other books, Paul simply invites the Ephesians to take a step back and marvel at the beauty of what God has done, not only restoring sinners to God, but also inspiring mortal enemies, Gentiles and Jews, to worship together the Savior and to love as they had been loved. Paul once again prays and preaches that they might rejoice and appreciate the majesty and compassion and the amazing plan of God through Jesus. The Christian faith is not just an idea, however. Beginning in chapter 4, Paul returns to practical mirrors, and trusting that they appreciate the wonder and gravity of what Jesus has done, Paul gives lots of down-to-earth practical instructions that radically transform the way Christians approach marriage, family, work, with guidance regarding sexuality, emotions, friendship, and social life. It's worth noting that what follows simply won't make sense until one begins to appreciate the beauty of the gospel. This is not advice for non-Christians or the world on how they should live. They undoubtedly will not live this way because they have not yet been transformed by the wondrous good news and kingdom of Jesus Christ. This is advice for transformed followers of Jesus who are included in him. It's for people of faith who seek to honor Jesus, walk in step with the Spirit, and who long to see God's plan fulfilled. Again, a major part of this plan is that humanity be united. And in Christ Jesus, all Christians are united in one faith, one hope, one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father of all. In fact, it's only through Jesus that we can have this unity built up by Him. The more closely connected to Jesus we are, the more closely connected we will be to our fellow Christians. For starters, it's clear that Christians will be different from how others and how they used to be. They'll no longer take their passions as their guide for life. They used to walk in darkness, living callously and selfishly. Now that's all to be thrown out. They are to replace rage with reconciliation, robbery with hard work, and slander with kindness and forgiveness. This new life means walking in love. In fact, we are to walk as children of the light, no longer as prisoners of the dark. Secrecy and deception are the opposite of what Christ has called us to. Likewise, sexual immorality is out of bounds. We're no longer to live pleasing only ourselves, but to love our neighbors and to glorify God. In fact, we're no longer to participate in these sinful and shameful social activities, getting drunk or being out of control sexually or otherwise. However, being one in Christ does not mean that we're all the same. There is unity, but Paul is not preaching uniformity. The church has a wide variety of different roles and tasks that need to be accomplished by different people. Paul gives practical instructions to end this book. Wives should submit to their husbands as an example of what it means to be faithful followers 
of Jesus. Husbands should love their wives more than they love themselves and to lay down their very lives, not looking for what they can get out of the relationship, but simply loving their spouses. Children are likewise to honor their parents. Fathers are not to provoke their children, but rather to bring them up in the way of the Lord. Likewise, those who are workers are to be faithful workers. Again, to demonstrate that faithfulness and service are more important than personal advancement. Bosses are not to threaten or abuse, but to realize the only true Lord and boss is the triune God of both them and their workers. Paul closes by encouraging Christians to stand firm against their enemies, which he clarifies are clearly not the people or rulers of this world. Rather, their enemies are the hidden evil forces of this world who seek to discredit Christ and encourage wickedness. The way they will win this war is not by military might or the weapons and tactics of this world, but by putting on the full armor of God. Truth, righteous living, the gospel of peace, faith, God's salvation, the sword of the spirit, and prayers in the spirit are their strategy and their refuge to fight. Paul closes by saying that even though he is a prisoner, he is nevertheless advancing the gospel. God's plan is unstoppable as it is unfathomably gracious.